So, um, as I promised that in sitting in front of you, um, I'll let Ken tell the story of your kale salads. Of course, we had to do kale salads. Um, talk about branding an event, huh? But it's real, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to you Ken Mishka. Uh, every kale event, I usually find a way to bring up my mother, who is like my hero in life. And she reads the newspapers like a banshee. And she then will cut things out. And every week, I get a big stack of things she thinks I ought to know about. And this summer, she gave me an article from the Chicago Tribune about Ken and Epiphany Farm. She goes, trust me, you're going to like this one. <laughs> so we read it. Um, I read it. And she was right. And so we contacted Ken. We even made a little road trip down to Bloomington, Illinois, to visit um, the farm, went on a tour of the farm, ate at his wonderful restaurant, and just received the hospitality of he and his brother and his wife and his children and everybody down there it was just fantastic and I would highly recommend that experience for you. Every animal on the farm has been given a name, so I only hope I didn't meet the guy that's on your plate. But, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the way farming goes. But Ken, I, I thought what would be so interesting is when we're thinking about strategy and collaboration across the business model, what happens if you're trying to look at the whole value chain and talk about like horizontal integration? That's what Ken is after in the spirit of fine food. So with that, I will turn it over to Ken. Cool, thank you. So on your plate, this isn't really a composed dish. You're not gonna be able to go to one of my restaurants and find this dish on the menu. Um, but it's just really supposed to, it's, it's to tell a story. So the one is that if we wanna eat things that are delicious, the cool thing about um, things that are delicious is that they're also high in nutrients and that every human being can actually taste nutrients. Things that are nutriently dense, that have a lot of micronutrients in them, tend to taste more delicious. And so that's really, really cool. I'm not talking about salt and sugar and fat, which are the things that typically trump deliciousness, but I'm talking about the, the actual keynotes of tasting something. So there's three different varieties of kale. There's Toscano kale, Red Russian kale, and Curly kale. These are all grown outdoors in extremely rich organic soil. Um, they're grown seasonally. We constantly are seeding our gardens. We plant every single week from the second week in February all the way up to the first of December. And we do that in the exact same climate zone as we are here in Chicago. And it's really interesting. We just have a few techniques to help us out. And I'm not talking about a bunch of heaters and energy. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the charcuterie. Charcuterie is starting to come back. There's a renaissance in butcher, butchers and nose to tail harvesting or utilization of product. And this is really, really important. We've seen a renaissance in culinary arts over the last 25 years, an explosion in culinary schools. We're seeing parents, not just the, the wives and the moms uh, focusing on providing the meals, but we're also seeing dads. Uh, even kids are getting excited about food. And then now we're seeing this type of preservation, this classic preservation of charcuterie or salt curing. You got you know, bacon, salami, copas, all these amazing things that we used to have to rely on in order to preserve our meat through the winter, through the summer when we didn't have refrigeration. Now, when you use every single part of the animal, um, you're left with a lot of other things that you can't usually put on the plate. Um, we can render a lot of the lard and we can use it to fry our french fries or um, I can base some uh, glazed carrots with it if it's going to be served with a pork chop. But um, another great thing that we can use is we make soap. And the soap kind of showcases the vertical integration that we have and also this just amazing amount of different products and industries that we can get into. And this soap in particular, it, it features a lot of the same things that are on your salad. The blooms, the herbs, the essential oils. Um, there's oatmeal, poppy seed for exfoliating. There's um, marigolds. It's all these great things. And in all the restrooms at the restaurant, we have our soap available. So when you go to the restroom, um, you can even use our soap. So everything comes right, right. It's all right there, which people really, really enjoy. Let's see if I figure this out. I, I grew up, I watched my dad start a business when I was three years old. He took a $5,000 loan out. He put it all on the table, risked it on one job. He doubled his income and he hasn't looked back ever since. He revolutionized an industry, and I can probably talk about that for about three hours. It, it's called wire guidance, and you basically put a line in a warehouse and the forklift trucks can guide on this wire. And I just saw him pursue excellence and become the best. His name of the company is called True Line, and that's because he puts an absolutely true line down the aisles of the warehouse. And this has been amazingly revolutionary for the industrial um, 
I guess, system of, of America and the world because instead of having to build all these big buildings, we're able to put these racks real, real close together and just shoot right down the aisle. And he became the best company in the United States doing this, and I was bored with it by the time I was 16. I was really looking for something else to do. I had two younger brothers and a younger sister. I figured one of them would probably take over my dad's company. And I was grounded, and my mom's like, you need to start spending more time with me. And she's like, why don't you take Wilton cake decorating classes? And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I was like, if it gets me out of this grounding, then I'll do it. Uh, I, I can't draw, I can't write, um, I'm an awful speller. I really wasn't a great student. Everyone would say that I had ADD. Um, I never was prescribed any medication for it or anything like that. And I always use it, I felt like it was an advantage. I could always jump around at different subjects. I can move real, real quick. I loved sports and activity. Um, and I, when I decided to become a chef, I was like, well, I'm gonna go to the best school in the world. It's the only school I applied to. I was denied, I did not get in, and I wasn't gonna have that for an answer. So I called the admissions department, I'm like, hey, is there any way I can figure this out? They're like, well, maybe you can have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, I asked my parents for a loan, I flew to New York, I talked my way into the best school in the world for culinary arts, and I did not look back. So after that, I went to the Broadmoor. This, re this resort really, really intrigued me because of the vertical integration. I was able to go and start working at the butcher shop. The butcher shop would get whole animals in. We'd butcher them, supply 18 on-premise restaurants. And basically, it is the best service in the world. Ever since Five Star or Five Diamond awards have been given out, they've never lost a star. And when you get to the top, it's very, very challenging sometimes to stay at the top. And that's what intrigued me so much about this resort. And Amazing individuals, the president of this resort was extremely influential to me. I'm very happy that I was able to spend time there. After I graduated culinary school, I convinced five of my best friends to move to Las Vegas. I had a bunch of other reasons, but my reasons were that I would be able to open up restaurants and simultaneously go to business school. I went to UNLV for hotel restaurant management. I crammed in classes. I'd sign up for eight, I'd drop out at two, I would pass four, and that's how I graduated. But meanwhile, I was working 70, 80 hours a week opening up restaurants for some of the greatest chefs in the world. Thomas Keller, I worked at his restaurant for a year. Um, we were co-chefs for the 2008 Bocuse d'Or Olympics. And in this kitchen, I learned about just absolute pure attention to detail. You don't talk, you don't joke around, you don't show up late, you don't go slow, you push as hard as possible. If you're gonna stand, you might as well fall, like at least move forward. And Thomas Keller was extremely influential. He's hold, held one of the best restaurants in the world for almost 15 years now. Then I went and worked for Bradley Ogden's. Bradley Ogden's at the time was the best new restaurant in the United States. It was located in Caesars Palace. We had contracted farmers in California that would specifically send us their best produce. We even had a buyer that worked at the Santa, Santa Monica Farmer's Market, scoped things out, and then shipped it to us. The menu would sit on the pass, the expo line, and every cook that was in charge of the station was also responsible by three o'clock to go up to the menu, cross out the ingredients that came out of season, enter in the ingredients that did, that were replacing it, and every single day we reprinted the menu, and this was the most seasonally focused menu in the country at the time, and because of it, it became the best new restaurant. All the chefs that I studied under, that Bradley Ogden's son and his friends, they all also went to the CIA, and they had also just worked for Charlie Trotter for the last year, and so it was a very, very similar style to Charlie Trotter's cuisine. Bradley Ogden's, um, this amazing uh, new restaurant, there was a new tower of Caesar's Palace that was opening up, and it was called Guy Savoie. Guy Savoie's goal was to bring three Michelin stars from Paris to Las Vegas. They wanted this just elaborate restaurant that was gonna be the most expensive a la carte restaurant in the United States. I was hired on as the saucier, and I basically did a lot of the training, I did a lot of the team building and hiring, and I was there on the ground floor to, to figure out a lot of the logistical issues of us trying to emulate food in Paris at this five-star, three Michelin-style level. And it was there where I started to think that this wasn't the direction I wanted to go. I love the attention to detail, I love the focus, I really enjoyed the passion of the chefs and the competition, but I did not love the fact that every single diner that ate there was influenced in a way that if they want to have the best meal of their life, then they have to scour the globe for these ingredients. That caviar, foie gras, and truffles is what makes a great meal. And then when my family came to dine there, I think they gave me the employee discount. I bumped them up with like three or four extra courses. They had a great meal, but at the end of it, my dad didn't understand anything. My mom knew a little bit, but they had no clues, completely over their head. 
And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't, you know, this isn't reality. This isn't how most of the restaurants in the world operate. No one's gonna understand any of this stuff. At the same time, Omnivore's Dilemma came out by Michael Pollan. I, I probably bought this book. It was probably in my shopping cart before it was actually released. I had heard about it. I had read a lot of Michael Pollan's work in the past. And this was extremely influential for me. When, after I finished this book, I closed it. And right away, the word Epiphany Farms came to my mind. I didn't know exactly where in the book it came from, but it was just like, wow, an epiphany, a sudden moment of insight that if I wanna actually do something with my career and my job, then I can kind of put everything in line. And I can go back to a farm and I can start studying these farms and figure out exactly how to produce this stuff. And then every single guest that comes and eats at my restaurant, I can influence them in a way that's going to change the world and make a brighter future. And so in this book, really my starting, my starting point, my only base resource, the, he mentions this guy named Joel Salatin. Joel Salatin has become very famous. He's probably the most successful, sustainable farmer in the United States right now. He's kind of like the godfather of cuisine. Just like the chefs that I learned about in culinary school, about Escoffier, who created the modern brigade system. He's, he was basically credited with the way that the kitchen is set up, where you have an executive chef, a sous chef, a saucier, a chef de partie, poissonnier. The, he created this. He brought structure to the kitchen. He trained a bunch of chefs. Those chefs went on to train other chefs. If you want to learn how to cook, what you have to do is you have to go find an establishment that you can directly link their lineage to Escoffier. And believe it or not, it's, it's very, very possible. In any of the great restaurants you go and eat at, I guarantee that there's people that studied under chefs, that studied under chef, who studied under chef, who met Escoffier. And he's the godfather of cuisine. And this is very, very popular, very talked about in culinary school. It's the number one textbook in every culinary school in the world. And I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, so if I learn how to cook by studying the chefs that study the chefs underneath this godfather of modern cuisine, well, who's the godfather of modern sustainable agriculture? And that was the idea. It was like, if I just pushed hard and I got 10, 15,000 hours of practice working as a chef, figuring out the tools, the techniques, the resources, well, I need to do that exact same thing to farming. So when I first started farming, I went to the hardware store and I purchased tools and they would break and they didn't work that well. And then finally I realized that if I actually want to become a great farmer, I need to look at farming through the professional lens that I look at cooking. And so I can't just buy tweezers at, at Meyer or Walmart. I can't just use plates from this. I need to find out where they're going from. So I started really looking into these these people and studying them. I would go to their farms, I would ask them questions, I would shoot them emails. Polyface Farms is really cool. Polyface, the farm of many faces. This idea that you can stack revenue generators and, and, and animals and they can work together symbiotically in an ecosystem. And so just to give you a quick example, he would take a big paddock with a hot wire and he would take 50 cows and put them on this paddock. And one day, they would eat the entire thing like someone just mowed it, like a golf course. The next day, at four o'clock, when the dew wasn't on the ground and it was nice and fresh and that, that they rested during the day, he moves them into a new paddock, a new salad bar. His beef, he calls it salad bar beef. And they get all of the nutrients of all these diversified pasture. They get legumes, they get, um, weeds, they get grasses, and then he just moves them on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And then behind the cows comes an egg mobile. It's a mobile chicken coop. The, the, the chickens are like homing missiles. They walk out of the chicken coop and they just go after these cow pies. The, the interesting thing is that when, when a cow makes a cow pie, it takes about three to five days for the fly larvae. It becomes an incubator, okay? It skins over and a bunch of parasites past and flies start to grow and they ultimately start to hatch. And when you go to a cow pie that's fresh, it'll be completely smooth, right? But if you go to a cow pie that's old, you'll find holes in it. The holes are all the eggs that have hatched and have now turned into bugs, mainly flies or mosquitoes, things like that. And so he realized that if he rotates the chickens three days behind the cows, then the larvae is gonna be the plump it's gonna be high protein. The chickens figure this out and you can teach them, which is crazy. You just cut it open, day number two, and you show the chicken, they figure it out once, they never forget it. And then they scratch it out and they, they, move, it, they move it around. And then they allow the, the grass to be able to go through. And then after the chickens move by, and they're moved every single day as well in a mobile chicken coop, 
that's powered by a solar powered panel that automatically opens the chicken door at sunrise and sunset and you train the chickens to go inside of it at night so they're not killed by predators like coyotes, fox, owls, minks, raccoons, skunks, you name it. There's hundreds of different predators that are out to get our animals and they're protected. They go to the new spot in the morning, we open the door, boom. Next cow pie, they're cleaning the pasture. And then that, that pasture we just had the chickens on, you don't touch that for 30 to 40 days. You let nature grow, you let it heal, you let it air out, sanitize, right? And so just keeps on rotating. So this is pasture rotation. He's super famous for this. Um, his books are amazing. Uh, you can farm pastured poultry profits, how to net $60,000 in six months off of 20 acres and referring to his system of raising broiler chickens. But the interesting thing is, is that he has an acreage and he's got all of these different revenue generators and systems that are working together and he's stacking them. So he has this one land and instead of saying, well, I'm just gonna raise my pigs here and then I'm gonna raise my cows over here. Now he has the same land, he has multiple ge revenue generators and they're actually, you see what I'm saying? You're getting a lot of value. So this ultimately leads to another farmer. And I've already heard three people ask it to me today, well, what do you do in the winter? My first year when I was telling them about my business plan, it's like, well, what are you gonna do in the winter? So I was like, I don't know, I gotta figure that out. I can remember it was in June of my first season. We were out just absolutely, you know, heat. We weren't really used to farming. It was our first time, just immense amount of failure. And I would sneak away and hide and read this guy's book because he held the key to how to produce things year round with zero energy inputs. And he did it with some just really, really simple planting techniques and planting the right thing at the right time and just knowing the limitations. And he's really, really studied this. And his name is Elliot Coleman. His farm is Four Season Farms in Maine. And he's also become one of the most famous farmers of the sustainable agriculture movement. Uh, Masumomo Fukuoka, he is the guy that coined natural farming in Japan. Like 40 years ago, he passed away, I think five or six years ago, but he had this amazing system. He had the highest yields of rice than any other farmer in Japan, Korea, or China. He was really like the best. He didn't do it in rice paddies. It was dry soil, but he had a really interesting, ingenious way of doing it. He would take clay that he harvested from a hillside, mix it with his rice seeds, turn it into little rice balls. He would walk into his barley pasture, his barley field about two weeks before the barley was ready to be harvested and he would just toss and broadcast these seed balls. They would fall, they would just sit there, they didn't have to get buried because they already had the soil around them and then he would come through the next, like two weeks later, a week later, harvest his barley, cut the straw, the straw would fall onto these seed balls and become the mulch. He would then let the chickens go in there occasionally right before they would germinate. They didn't see the seeds because it was covered in the, in the um, clay and they would fertilize it, they would break down the crop residue, and then boom, comes the rice. And then when the rice was almost ready to harvest, he did the exact same thing with barley, and so on, and so forth, and he said, you know what? I don't do anything on my farm. I don't till, I don't prune, I don't trellis, I don't have to spray chemicals, and he was the pioneer of natural farming. His book, One Straw Revolution, is a 100-page book that will completely change your perspective on life, and I highly recommend it for anyone um, that reads, really. It's not even about just farmers. <laughs> right. So this brings me to Bill Molson. Bill Molson is the godfather of permaculture. And he was in Australia studying forest and sustainable uh, forestry. And he was basically the one that realized that, you know what we can do is we can emulate nature and we can actually design it the way that we want to so that it benefits us. And so I can create this thing called a food forest where I have, I alternate things between it's called nap, okay? So I put a nitrogen fixer, then I put an apple, and then I put a pear or a plum. And then I put another nitrogen fixer, like a black locust or a honey locust, or a different shrub that takes nitrogen out of the atmosphere and puts it into the soil, allows the plants around it to grow. And then I would even, as I go through my nap, nitrogen fixer, apple, plum, nitrogen fixer, apple, plum, each one that I'm going to, I even plant a different cultivar. So each tree becomes an island of its own. And then the insects and pests and disease that are attacking that tree, they have nowhere to go. They can't go to the nitrogen fixer because it's you know, full of predators and they, they're not gonna go to that next apple because it's an apple they don't like. And when you get the system going and then you put shrubs and brambles and perennial fruits and you, you put up hedgerows with 
um, beneficial blooms, like the blooms that you have on your salad, um, you create an ecosystem. And you create an ecosystem that you can eventually just take a nap, right? Mm -hmm. So, our bread, uh, Dan Barber, uh, amazing chef, Blue Hill Stone Barns. If anyone's in New York, it's an absolute must go to. Um, Rockefeller donated a huge plot of land and millions of dollars to a sustainable agriculture school. And Dan Barber was the founding chef. He was basically my idol and my icon. He was handed my dream. And I was like, I, I love him for that. And I follow him very, very intensely. His new book called Third Plate is really great. But he says our bread basket is threatened today not because of diminishing supplies, but because of diminishing resources, not by low combines or tractor inventions, but by fertile land, not by pumps, but by fresh water, not by chainsaws, but by forests, not by fishing boats and nets, but by fish in the sea. You want to feed the world? Start start by asking ourselves how we're going to start by asking how we're going to feed ourselves, or better, how can we create the condition that every community can feed itself? And so that's the way that I'm looking at food and I look at my restaurant systems is how can we create something that is going to be as sustainable as possible, influence people, get them excited about it, and get them the information they need to live a healthier life that's more nutriently dense. So I grew up in Downs. My father's business um, was very successful. He bought a couple plots of land. I was in ninth grade, just my first year of high school, when we bought a 75-acre plot of land with a beautiful pasture, a south-facing slope, right on the moraine in McLean County. And I never farmed it. I would run around on four-wheelers, I'd go build tree houses, I'd play paintball, all the things that most kids do when they have a bunch of land. Um, but I never really farmed it. And it wasn't until I read The Omnivore's Dilemma that I really decide on going back to Downs, a town of 600 people right outside of Bloomington Normal, the middle of nowhere. And the reason why I decided that was because in a chapter in Omnivore's Dilemma, he talks about what ended the small farm. And it was Earl Butts, the director of agriculture during the Nixon administration, signed a bill into law, which has been the one that's mostly, most recently updated, the farm bill, which said plant corn from fence row to fence row. It turned farmers on each other. It destroyed the landscape. People would say, um, if I have a, a smart child, don't, don't stay on my farm, go, go to the city. Like all of a sudden we just stripped all of our rural communities of their intellectual investments and we sent them to these larger areas. And that bill was signed into law in Bloomington and my county is the number one producer of corn and soybeans almost annually. It's basically considered the capital of conventional agriculture. And so I was like, there it is. If I go to the coast, it's already starting to come. It's already a movement. If I go to Madison, Wisconsin or Boulder, Colorado, it's already moving. But if I can go and I can farm next to these guys, a lot of the kids that I grew up with who are now starting to take over 10,000 acre farms, I can get in their heads. I can describe this stuff to them. I can inspire them. I can show them hospitality. And then we can start to redesign the agricultural landscape. So the plan back then was real simple. Season one, get a loan, find my partners, do some research and development, and then actually go to a farmer's market. So town of 600, it was a very small farmer's market. Year two, go to the bigger farmer's market, get a CSA member thing set up where people would pay us $400 at the beginning of the season and we'd give them a basket of food every week. Um, do dinner parties, presentations, and, and grassroots community outreach. And then season three, Restaurant. I don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know how big, I have no idea, I've never farmed, I gotta figure that out, right? And so that was basically um, where we're at. This is the first greenhouse that I bought. I probably wouldn't buy this greenhouse again because I didn't know. And at the time I had the name, I didn't have a logo, I didn't really understand. My brother there is on the ladder helping me build it. I had only had one of my partners convinced to move here from Sacramento, California. His name was Mike Mustard. I was I was on my way to having my second, my wife, who is currently working for Samsung in Seoul, Korea. And we were doing a long distance relationship and I was like, all right, come on, you know, this is great. And her family, she's like, there's no way in hell my family's gonna let me live on a farm and move from here. And then uh, another chef who was working for Joel Robichon, who we'd worked together and he was from Pennsylvania and he was the hardest worker I've ever met in my entire life. And I was like, all right, I gotta get these people. I just don't know how. And so I started to work and convince them and I needed to get a logo, I needed to get an image, and these are the greenhouse clamps. And I, we were taking a time-lapse photo, like every 10 seconds of this greenhouse as we built it, and I just took those greenhouse clamps and I put them in front of the camera, and the picture came out like this. It's not edited, that's just 
it was perfect. I was like, all right, cool. Integrated systems, vertical integration, everything's connected. So it made sense. And so that was, we adopted that as, as our logo. It's my wife. We now have two kids, Clover and Comfrey. Um, Clover, a medicinal herb. Comfrey, an extremely medicinal herb, uh, which you can't kill, by the way. And uh, <laughs> Chef Stu and his mom. This is my brother, Matt. Um, Matt is now the livestock director. When I originally wrote the business plan, he was gonna be the farm manager. It took me three years to be able to get the income of the farm up high enough to be able to justify his salary and bring him on um, as a partner. Failure, all right. So, cooking and farming. If I fail in cooking and I'm cooking pasta, I fail, I'm trying to make it al dente, right? So if I would cut the noodle open, it'd be like a really small trace of a little bit of white, but have a nice little snap to it but it won't be mush and it won't be too hard to where, you know, it just brittle. Well, if I mess it up, I can have new pasta cooked in 10 minutes. Well, if you plant a seed that's got a 120 day season and you get to the end, 120 days, and you realize you messed up, well, you might not have the courage to say, okay, well, I'm gonna take notes and next year when I can plant that that one week in the season, I'm gonna make sure I don't make that mistake. But knowing food and accepting failure on the regular really, I think, made us focus on taking notes, jumping back, experimenting, not worrying about failure, and actually looking at failure as our greatest success. And I know this is very popular um, among businesses, and it's something that I'm sure everyone in this room can accept, that they're just gonna learn from their failures. Well, my very first planting was 3,000 seeds. I took a $20,000 loan out to start the farm, in the first season, we basically blew through all of that. I'm gonna show you how much money we made the first year. It was not impressive. And I grow these seeds and they all died, like 3,000 seedlings. My entire first season of greens, in the beginning, this is right when the greenhouse was getting made, so I was a couple days late on getting the plastic on the greenhouse, so I had to leave the, the greens in my house a little bit longer underneath some lights. I didn't understand anything about it. There's a thing called dampening off. All of a sudden, the plant looks healthy one day, you wake up the next day, and they're all just flat on the ground dead. And I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I gonna go? So we turn to this guy, Dave Barron. Five years prior to this, I met him at a farmer's market and he, I asked him if I can go to his farm. He took me to his farm, I dug my first potatoes, I pulled out my first carrots, I found my first wild mushroom under his supervision, and I was like, you know what, there's this guy. I don't remember his name, I remember where he lives, let's go talk to him. He had open arms. We walked out of a meeting with him. We were just randomly stopping at his house. He gave us seed catalogs. He gave us catalogs on irrigation, cedars. And then for that first two seasons, he put us under his wing and we studied under him. And he was, ready to, he was ready to retire. So it was absolutely perfect timing. This is our first farmer's market. So I'm at the farmer's market and this guy walks up to me that looks like this. You can imagine how that conversation went. He is hilarious. He's absolutely crazy. His name's Drake. He's a genius. He's an amazing philanthropist. Um, he's like leading the fight on world malaria. He has written books that are just giant volumes. Um, he has a website. His last name is Drake Zimmerman. He comes up to me. He says, hey, I, you know, I love your name. Where do you come up with it? And you know, what are the pitfalls of you starting your farm? And I really want to see you succeed. He talks about 100 miles per hour. And I'm like, well, honestly, I'm starting a farm on a new farm and I need some implements, I need some old equipment, but I don't have anything, because it's brand new, and I don't have a big pile of junk to go pull from. He's like, I have a pile of junk. He's like, why don't you just come to my house? He's like, I got a whole barn full of it. I've been collecting it, specifically for a small farm. Rain barrels that have 500 gallon capacity, greenhouses, chainsaws still in the box, like all these things. He was just collecting it, because he, he he's a philanthropist. He sees the, he knows that if he helps people do this, then, it's gonna take everyone in the right direction. And his wife is a corporate coach who actually studies coaches, Jan Elfline. Um, and I'm just absolutely blessed by the fact that they care about our success. And that's a common thread because our concept and our ideology is about everyone. It's not just about us and making money and being profitable. It's about the system. Every single person comes to us and wants us to succeed. Things just pop up out of the blue. They just give us opportunity. They just give us money, capital, everything. It's absolutely amazing when you can link what your goals of your company are with what the goals of the culture or society are. So really early on, we made $100 a week at the farmer's market. We were going broke. 
And I finally got on Chef Stu to come out. He came out in September and I'm like, listen, man, the only way we're getting through the dinner part, getting through the winter is if we start doing these dinner parties. So we did a dinner party for 30 people because it was going to make us some money. And at the end of the dinner party, two people came up to me and said that was the best meal of my life. And I was like, all right, cool. Well, the next day I did a dinner party for eight people, like seven of them, probably all eight of them came up to me and said it was the best meal of my life. And I was like, okay, you want to make an impact? We want to get this thing rolling? Let's do eight to 12. Let's do small dinner parties. Let's not do anything big. Let's not get crazy. Let's not go after profit. Let's go after impact. And so we did it and they just caught on like wildfire. We do a dinner party. They booked two people would book two more. It just, in 15 months, we did 115 dinner parties. It got the attention of the Chicago Tribune. We actually came up and cooked for Chicago Tribune. I cooked in um, Ed Russ, the president of State Farm. I cooked in his office. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on of these amazing people within our community that just want us to cook for them. In 2009, this is really confusing, and 480% is something that's really important. The, when I did the calculations of our production for the first year, I realized that if I actually wanted to sustain a restaurant, I would need to have 400% increase in productivity annually in order to get to where we need to be. And that has not changed. We have quadrupled in production every single year. This is now our sixth growing season. Uh, we made $2,000 at the farmer's market the very first year. We didn't even start till September. We made $14,000 in dinner parties. The second year, $51,000 in dinner parties. This sheet, you don't have to look at any of this. It's not really that important. The only thing that's important is the fact that we were tracking everything. When we started doing dinner parties, it was $25 a person because I couldn't even give them away at first. We didn't have a reputation. No one knows who the hell Guy Savoie is. Like, we're in the country, okay? So 25 bucks a person, I'm blown away. Weeks go by, I keep on raising the price. Well, one of the interesting things that we figured out was that at 50 bucks, at 45, we were receiving these fat gratuities, huge tips. At 50, the tips came way down. They came down to like the 18% level. When we raised the price to 75, one asshole didn't even tip us. I was like, you gotta be kidding me, right? When we went to 100, the guests actually told me they thought that it was included, okay? The interesting thing about that is that was the demographics cap. At $45, that was all they could afford. It's all they could put a value on it. And so we actually now have designed our fine dining restaurant around these numbers, and we've also proven them over the long haul that if we want people to come back consistently, we can't charge them more than $45. So the target market of our restaurant is 38 to $42. In Chicago, I could sell probably for 75 or 80, and I have people that specifically drive from Chicago to our restaurant because they say that they can drive, get a hotel room, enjoy our meal, have a better experience, and it's cheaper than going to a restaurant downtown Chicago. So, so you can see these keep on going up, and tracking data has been super, super important to us. Um, I learned that at the Broadmoor, it's like someone checks in, it's like, okay, you like your pillow to be firm or soft? It's like, same exact thing happens with our guest database. We have two guest databases, we track everything, we send gifts out during the holidays, just all the things you have to do to build a proper following. Unexpected opportunity. So year three, we quit dinner parties. Cold turkey. So absolutely not. I was like, I got to go to the drawing board, we got to write the restaurant plan. So I wrote a business plan for six months. I started going to other restaurant tours in the area. I started talking to um, people that would may possibly have an opportunity for us. We find a, a space, we call it the Monroe space, and we we're gonna put a 45 seat restaurant. It was gonna cost us $480,000. I went to all my investors, potential investors, and I learned a great lesson, which don't go to your number one investor first or your number one potential investor first, go to them last, right? Because every single time you pitch a concept, you get better at it. And so it's like, well, get, you know, get a few practice runs in there. I had pledges for um, you know, the majority of it. And then also this guy calls me up and he's like, hey, my name's Chad. I own this restaurant called Central Station Cafe. My chef just walked out. I don't have a manager. We're doing a local sustainable food event this weekend. I was like, yeah, I know, I'm going. He's like, well, I need you to come cook. I was like, okay. Um, it's gonna take me three days for my guests. It was 140 guests, six course meal, no problem. So I'll do it, I need $1,500 cash, but here's the kicker, it's gonna cost about $400 in food and I'm not serving anyone else's food. You're gonna have to buy all my own food. He said, absolutely no problem. We put out the six courses. When I was prepping, an employee came up to me and asked me if I'd care for a cocktail. And I'm like, all right, I'm not one to just, you know, I don't, I'm a chef, I don't usually deny cocktails or drinks. If you ask me at 11 in the morning if I like a drink, I'll probably say yeah, just because that's what we do. And uh, so I'm like, yeah, they've, 
this employee brings me like the big gulp of gin and tonics, all right? This place was just imploding. The culture at this restaurant was so flawed, it was, like, it was ridiculous. It was just absolutely dying, and it was huge. The restaurant had been there for 27 years. It's a mainstay, but it smelled like shit. The, 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 bath, the basement was just flooding all the time. They put no money into it. The owner, Chad, who's owned it now for seven years, he bought it because his friends were running it and convinced him to buy it as a real estate investment. He lost $100,000 a year annually. And he's like, listen, just come in and make it so that I'm not losing money. And so we set up a bunch of goals. We're like, this is gonna take us a few years to get turned around. We're like, if we meet these goals in nine months, we want an opportunity to buy it. We wanna know what the building is worth now. We wanna know what the business is worth now. And so we kept on rocking. We had to change the culture. And so there's a lot of things. Start from scratch. First week, actually, even before that, when we, when we decided to do this, we didn't have an agreement. We just showed up. Like, we saw the opportunity, he's like, I just need help. Like, all right, we just showed up for two weeks. We acted like the executive chefs of this restaurant and just took it over. We just told the cooks what to do. We started throwing away things. We're like, there's opportunity here. We will not lose money. We will make money. We will be able to buy this place. It's huge. 240, it's, well, Basically, with downstairs, is about 200 seats. Upstairs is a banquet facility with 240 seats. And there's another loft space, which we ended up turning into a restaurant, which has 100 seats. This is a really big piece of real estate. And it's existed there for a really long time. It's super famous in our area. Start from scratch. Instead of buying stuff pre-made in the freezer, we would say, we're going to make this from scratch. We provided no recipes to the cooks, and we threw away everything that was pre-made, anything that had artificial coloring in it, anything that um, had um, refined carbohydrates in it, anything that was from genetically modified um, resources or GMOs, we just got rid of it. And we just started saying, okay, we're going to do this from scratch. We're going to elevate the cuisine by doing it with local product, organic, sustainable. Hiring, presenting a framework. It's amazing when you hire someone and you can actually present the framework of what's going on inside the corporation or inside the company before they come on, you can, you can basically like design soldiers to come into your establishment and do the things that you want to get done because they don't have any point of reference. You can just tell them like, hey, here's the problems with our culture. Here's the issues that we're having. Help me. Let's solve this. Peer reviews and goals. You get hired at our company. You go through a series of interviews. You then come on and we frame it as much as we possibly can. I try and uh, inspire them as much as I can. And then after that, I just let them do their thing. I don't, don't worry about it. At the 30 day mark, at 30 shifts, a peer evaluation goes out to every employee. My employees are paid to fill out these evaluations. It's mandatory. They fill out an evaluation. It's a 15 question evaluation. How is their attire? How is their appearance? How is their general perceived attitude? If you were the owner, would you hire them? And then any other additional comments. And then based on those votes, you either stay on our team or not. And so if I have an employee that has three or four people that say, you know what, this guy's kind of an asshole outside of work. I don't want him to be on our team. They don't get hired. But it's not the end of the day. We give them the insight, we give them the feedback and the criticism, and we say you're actually on a suspension for six months. In six months, if you work on these negatives, if you work on your negative characteristics, you can come back and we'll hire you on. And already now we've had two employees that did not make it on the team because of this feedback and because of the way that they worked, and they worked on it, and now they're still on our team and they're thriving. Family meal, we eat together every day at four o'clock. We sit down and the entire Meal, uh, everyone sits down to a meal. Each cook on each station has to be the chef for the day. Um, so it's up to the cooks to practice and, and move forward. Stacking cheese. This is a Lupe Fiasco song. Uh, it goes like something, something, something. Stack that cheese. Well, this is the cousin. All right, so we have these pre shifts where we say, okay, everyone outside. And we would be like, it was like the Super Bowl, right? And I'm the quarterback of the, of the team that's about to go on the field and we're going to win and we're going to get everyone pumped up. We do this every single service. Before guests walk into our building, like we stack that cheese, we break. You, you should hear the roars that come out of it. It's amazing. Like we completely just get amped about serving people and doing the best that we possibly can on a daily basis. So cutting the tape. At Thomas Keller's restaurant, if you tore the tape that you write a label on, you would just get absolutely destroyed by your peers. So you cut the tape. And I asked Chef Thomas Keller, how did that happen? Like where did that come from? He's like, well, if one person raised the level of expectation, and we never look back. When we do things better and we move forward, we don't go back, we keep on moving forward. And this cutting the tape is a symbol of attention to detail and constant progress. Broken windows, kind of like Malcolm Gladwell. Um, for instance, if at this desk, 
were an absolute mess right now, or let's say my station as a cook was an absolute mess, then it would be really, really hard for me to do a great job and to be able to keep it clean. And broken windows, so we constantly clean it up, open lines of communication, and honesty. So the epiphany, epiphanization, we, after two years, we were able to study the market, change the restaurant. When we took it over, they had just changed the name, so we couldn't change the name right away, and we didn't want to. We didn't have any capital behind us. We had to do everything from the internally. Um, the restaurant was in financial, like it was way behind. And uh, we basically want to study it and, and do the things that we can possibly do. And we, we epiphanized it. So I'm going to show you a video real quick that talks a little bit about the, the epiphanization and the remodeling of it. Five years ago, we started a company called Epiphany Farms. And the goal was to design a farm with the menu of the restaurants in mind. Started growing vegetables to practice, to figure out how, how it was done. How do you grow carrots? How do you grow onions? And creating a more sustainable approach towards menu design, menu development, so that every person that comes into our restaurant uh, is influenced in a way that is positive for our world and our community and our environment. And it's crazy to think that a restaurant can do that, but it is possible. The problem with the conventional restaurant system is it is very wasteful. Our model, Epiphany Farms Enterprise, eliminates that waste stream. We're vertically integrated to recycle everything back into the system. It goes back to the farm and is utilized in a ecologically, economically, and socially responsible manner. I dogged the conventional system so hard when I started my farm. I was like, this is crap, I can do it better. And it's not, it's so efficient. It's so good at what it does. The global food system is maybe the greatest human mechanism that's ever been conceived and developed. And so to say that we need to throw that away and we need to go back 100 years, I think is maybe not the point. I think what we need to do is we need to take everything that we've learned from this system and then we need to look at nature and say, okay, what do you want to do? What do you want to grow? Things that are grown proper and allowed to mature with nature, harvested at the proper time, cooked and prepared fresh, are better. They taste 10 times better. In nature's systems, it, it knows, it just does it. If we leave it alone, it produces an amazing amount of abundance. Four miles away, we have hundreds of varieties of vegetables, and we've already been able to build a system that does that. Station 220 was amazing because we took over that restaurant as consultants, and we took over an existing establishment. We transformed that restaurant to be one of the best restaurants in Central Illinois. We learned a lot over those three years. But when you have a restaurant, if it's not hitting on all cylinders, you have to make these little tweaks and you have to adjust it a little bit. And I think that we've pinpointed a few key things that we need to do to be that spot. But through producing these dishes for Station 220 over the last three years, we've seen our production costs come down. We've become more efficient. We've become better farmers. We've actually been able to drive the production costs of our food down to a point to where with the new restaurant we can offer it in a way that's way more affordable and more accessible. And also by us studying the market and listening to our customers, they want to be able to come to Epiphany Farms restaurant two, three times a week, not two, three times a year because of the amount of people backing us and like believing in our concept and believing in the Epiphany, we can now finally open up Epiphany Farms restaurant. I don't remember where I was going with that, but we got a wall to hang, so what else you got for me? You can come, bring the entire family, eat healthy, nutritious, local, organic food all night long. Feel better about yourself, feel better about the dollars that you spent and the environment and the impact that you made in a sustainable way, and then also be able to do it on the regular. I think that we're beyond the fad stage of eating local, eating organic, and our generation is starting to understand that if we want to do right by the next generation, if we want to continue to increase the health of the environment, that we need to change our ways a bit. By the time we open up the doors after the rebranding and the relaunch, I hope that it's going to have energy behind it and a buzz in this town. I hope it's going to send a serious message to all the other restaurant tours, all the other restaurant chains in the area and in the world that we are building a foundation for a legacy that can be a part of something bigger. So that was our a launch video when we rebranded and we closed the restaurant for 10 days. Um, we strategically did it during the slowest time of the year. And so we closed it for 10 days. We did everything ourselves. 
Um, we rebranded the downstairs and we also turned a bar that was only had one employee above the restaurant into a restaurant as well uh, in January. And when we did that, we wanted to create another demographic that we were going after. So we created a restaurant that had $22 price checks. So you wouldn't spend that much money, it'd be casual. And this is some of the pictures of Epiphany Farms and the food is, um, you know, it's seasonal, it's ever changing. So we have this restaurant, we have a space above that was super underperforming. And we're like, we need to put a, a restaurant here. What do we want to eat? What do we want to go to? What do our customers not have with the restaurant downstairs? And at this time, it was still called Station 220 Downstairs, um, which we had turned into like this fine dining restaurant, the best in the area. And it, we went all the way up to a $55 check out, which was too high for our demographic. Um, so we upcycled. We, these are the lights that we took down from the downstairs restaurant. We changed them. We, we upcycled basically everything. Uh, strategic moves and calculated risks. It's like, well, if we're already paying the taxes and the rent for this place, well, we might as well be utilizing as much square footage as possible. Looking at the demographic, what does the demographic want? Setbacks equal opportunity. We couldn't fit the two, the kitchen was too big for this new restaurant to fit in one area. So we were going to have to break up the kitchen between two different areas. And then something fun for all and then the right price point. The one of the things that, that we saw with this was we wanted to do Anju, which means uh, it's basically Korean bar snacks or food that pairs well with alcohol. Uh, and we were going to sushi restaurants in demographic. And one thing I noticed was that at every sushi restaurant, there was never more than four or five guests at a table because people in the country don't like raw fish. And so it'd be really hard to get everyone to come out together. And so I was like, okay, well, let's turn this into an opportunity. If our kitchen is, can't be in one spot, let's just turn two different concepts. And so we turned one into a sushi concept that was doing Neapolitan, I mean, sushi restaurant that was doing Japanese and Korean style sushi, uh, dumplings, Chinese dumplings, steam buns, dim sum. And then on the other side, we put in a Neapolitan style pizza oven. And we started doing Neapolitan freshly tossed pizzas and tapas and bar food like, like wings and, and things that people could be accustomed to. So now we have these like 20 person events where like eight of them will have sushi and then the other 12 don't feel uh, uncomfortable when they eat the pizza. All of these videos were produced in-house with just pulling the resources of our own team. 
Um, we now have 60 employees, and it's amazing when you actually look at your team and figure out what other resources do they have or what other things do they want to do. So, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard, like in Good to Great or uh, Built to Last, they talk about there's this uh, like 80 20 rule, like between you know, work 80% of your time and the things that are absolutely yeah, that have to do with your, your position and then work 20% of the time on the things that can benefit the business but are something you enjoy. And it's like when you actually implement that and you pull your resources internally, you can make amazing things happen. So all the construction, all the design, all the um, interior, interior design and also all the photos that we do in-house um, are all done by employees that work for the team. This is our team at Anju from the opening day. So we have this so we have kung fu movies playing upstairs um, that symbolize the battle of these two cuisines. And then there are two open kitchens. And so the chefs show up nightly to battle, like whose cuisine is better. And it's crazy. You wouldn't think that sushi and pizza goes well, but it really does. It's super delicious together. So some of the sushi that we do. So now I just want to, I'm going to go through a quick slideshow just to kind of show you some of the things on the farm. Um, the farm is 4.2 miles away from the restaurant. We own 10 acres. Um, we have access to 30 plus from neighbors that um, have granted us access to that that we are now renting. Uh, permaculture designed ecosystem. Um, everyone on their salad, you had calendula. I also wanted to get fennel blossoms, nasturtium, and pineapple sage. But you know, just be happy because by you consuming that stuff, it's not only healthy for you and great for your skin, delicious, um, but it also uh, creates a habitat for beneficial insects. And it makes, it makes our ecosystem more diverse and also more um, resilient. So when we have times of, of disease or, or struggle. This is the bridge, there's a, the Kickapoo Creek that goes through it. That's the creek, that's my house right there. I live on the farm and Chef Stu lives right next to the restaurant. This is my first cow. Um, we practice the pasture rotation, her name is Pam. One of the interesting things about my company and my position is that you know none of us had ever milked a cow before, right? And so we, 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 I bought a cow, I bought a milker, a surge milker, if anyone knows what that is, it's like they don't make them anymore. And I trained myself and I practiced it and I mastered it. And then I trained my next person and now I don't, I don't milk the cow anymore. I don't have time to milk the cow. The cow needs someone else, right? Um, but this idea that I'm, I'm working on these systems and then training someone and filling that position and then I'm just looking back at those systems and, and keeping them in line. So we have goats. We, do, we milk a cow. We have two cows that we milk. We have five goats that we milk. Legally, we are not allowed to make cheese, although we do make a lot of cheese. Um, these are our piglets. We raise all of our pigs on pasture. They're very, very happy pigs. They're laid right down right next to me when I go up to them. Um, that little wire right there, we train the pigs when they're four weeks old to a wire, um, and that is our steering wheel. And so we rotate our pigs every single week to a new paddock. Um, and then the interesting thing we do is we have a livestock trailer. Um, we bring it into their pen when they're four weeks old and we let them use it as a shelter. They eat in it, they sleep in it. And then when we move them to a new paddock on the other side of the property, we use our, the same exact livestock trailer. And then if we ever have to move them back into the barn, we use the livestock trailer. And then if we ever need to bring them to slaughter, we use the livestock trailer. And we put it in the pen like two to three days before. There's no stress. They consider it home. And then one day we pick them up and it's extremely humane. There's no, no stress whatsoever, which is cool. Um, we raise all of our birds. We do about 2,500 birds a year for the restaurant. It's only a six month production system because it's seasonal, it's on pasture. So we have to raise all the birds for the entire year in six months. And then we have a warehouse where we were gonna put our first restaurant. We've actually converted that into a warehouse where we just lined with freezers. It stores all of our product. And then now this winter, we'll be turning that into our, um, our internet uh, storefront. This is our first egg mobile that we built. Um, so the chickens, they're, they're now leaving the like honing, homing missiles on those cow patties. This is my daughter, Clover, when she was about one, maybe a little like one and a half. Um, we slaughter most of our chickens. We have a poultry exemption. We're able to slaughter 3,000 chickens on our property a year. Um, we've gotten this to a point where we, we can harvest 80 chickens in an hour and have them packaged and cooled down and ready to go. Um, and she knows every single step of it. She also knows the, the farm very, very well. We raise bees, sustainable sweeteners. I raise sugar beets, doing everything we possibly can um, to not have to use outside resources. This is a cucumber blossom. So Alenia, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of the restaurant Alenia. It's very popular. Uh, Italy, uh, a lot of these restaurants that I'm now supplying, they want all of this specialty stuff, like these really, really nice, sexy blooms and these garnishes here, they die for that. And it's actually really expensive because it's so perishable and very hard to transport. Um, and that's what we specialize in. 
So I, I, all these things that they're really interested in. I, I, I sell a ton of daylilies. Funny thing about daylilies is I couldn't fill an order one day for daylilies, and I was on Randolph Street, and they ordered daylilies from me, and I honestly, I pulled over, and I went to the center median of Randolph Street. I harvested a bunch of daylilies and sold them to the restaurant. Um, <laughs> so, That, that, this idea, um, so when I was looking at Bradley Idens, that farm fresh restaurant, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I, uh, I saw that we were buying all these petite microgreens, and there was some on your salad, a little thing with the two little leaves on it, really small. Um, and I was like, I, I did some research on it, and I was like, wow, we're buying like 120, 140 hours of microgreens a week. And I, I was like, these are easy to do. I mean, this takes two and a half weeks to sprout. I get rid of my computer desk in my apartment next to my bed. I put in a bunch of microgreen flats. I started raising all my own microgreens, and then I would sell them to the restaurant that I was working at. I started a company, um, I started selling these microgreens, and this is this idea of this like stacking multiple revenue generators, and a lot of people like to look at it as like double dipping, because I'd be like designing the dishes and be like, no, we gotta use more microgreens. <laughs> so, these are all just wild berries. We grow like 20 different varieties of berries on the farm. This is a South Bay, this is a test greenhouse. This is like three years ago. Um, but this is the middle of winter. It's completely snowing outside. Uh, and, and what happens is we're in the Northern Hemisphere, so we fall away from the sun. And so on the shortest day of the year, the sun is at like a 30 degree uh, angle to, to, from the south. And so if you, if you slope your greenhouses or your garden beds 30 degrees towards the south, um, the snow will melt faster, it'll stay warmer. You put one layer of protection, you're now farming in uh, the southern tip of Illinois. You put two layers of protection, you're now farming like south of Tennessee and in the winter. And so it's, it's really cool to see how much protection that these, how well these greens do. And these are called winter annuals that grow in the winter. We don't try and grow tomatoes and eggplants, um, but we grow like things like spinach, arugula, uh, clatonia, onions, um, lettuce, all these things grow for us year round. This is my house with a, the, the greenhouse. The greenhouse we built at a, the first location, we remodified it and we grow that here now. This is my first, first tractor, Alice Chalmers. All of our tractors are um, from either the 50s or 60s. My Ford. And then it's kind of, this is the important part, right? Our farm occurs in nutrients. Um, we, 25% of the products that we use at our restaurant are being purchased from our farm. Um, this year alone is $125,000 worth of product that we actually sold to our restaurants. I purchased in total about a half a million dollars in food. Um, this is the first year I've distributed to Chicago. My goal is to do $20,000 of sales to Chicago and I'm just using my pickup truck. Every Thursday I come up here at five counts. Um, I'm already up to $30,000 and it looks like I won't even be stopping. And now we're in the process of purchasing a delivery vehicle, launching an online website, a uh, storefront. Four pillars of success. This is, I just wanted to touch on this real quick. I kind of break my business into four different departments. Um, you have planning up the top left. You have planning, um, tilling the soil, uh, timing sheets, successional plannings, you have your uh, cultivating, harvesting, and then everything that happens after it comes out of the soil is harvesting. This is like our, our distributor chain, uh, the cold chain, keeping it washed, keeping it fresh. You know, how do I make all this stuff look so fresh um, and, and stay, have a shelf life? And that's the problem with small farms. The industry knows that local means that it doesn't last as long. It's more expensive and it doesn't last as long because small producers don't have the technology to keep things cold and harvest and at, at a like peak uh, level. So that's something that we're really working on. Then you have everything with cooking and then it's all about outreach and the customers. Well, I'm really good at that now. I've been doing that for six years and I work a lot of hours on the farm. My team works a lot and we really never distributed. We would throw it in the back of our pickup truck and we'd have it at the restaurant in 10 minutes. And so it could get washed at the restaurant, washed a little bit at the farm and then wash the restaurant and put it into the cooler. Um, and so we didn't really ever develop a distribution chain. And then cooking, got that down. I've been doing that for a long time now. And then we're really good at guest services. And so this goal of us distributing to Chicago and working on that pillar of our business is really, really important. That's our main focus going into next year. We're hoping to quadruple our sales of Chicago uh, by next year. And this has to do with the product catalog, um, things like that. Short-term goals, I have a ton of long-term goals, but continually tightening up the restaurant systems. Uh, we're implementing a new bed system this year, and if anyone's interested in learning about that, I, I'd love to tell you about it. Um, designing a product catalog, we're buying a delivery vehicle. Um, that Monroe space, we're turning into our corporate office, um, as well as an event space, and then that'll be where we um, fill orders for the online website, the storefront. 
Um, and then an employee speakeasy for, it's all about our employees. Like, it's really more about them than it is anything about our company. It's like when I sit down with my employees, it, I put the ball in their court. Like, are you coming in to work every single day ready to go? It's like we're brutally honest with them. If they're hungover, if they're not happy, if they're disappointed. I have an employee that was there when we first started. Uh, we, sh we walk into this restaurant that first week we took it over, and he's like, you guys are Epiphany Farms. I'm like, yeah. He's like, I just applied to work at your farm. He's like, I was going to quit here. And I was like, you got to be kidding, kidding me. So he didn't have to quit. He's been working with us ever since. We've offered him a management position now for two years. This kid can accomplish so much, and he's underperforming. He goes home and he plays video games every single night. His last employee review, I told him I'm done. January 1st, he doesn't have a job anymore. It's like, unless he steps up, it's not right for him. I'm not gonna let people underperform and not, and not excel and not show up every single day and get better. And so he's got the ultimatum. And I even send up, I set him up with some coaching sessions. I've hooked him up with some mentors. And maybe my company's not right for everyone. Um, but I'm not gonna let people just kind of hang out, just show up and have a job. That's, that's not what our company's gonna be about. So um, I did have a, something I wanna talk about. I think I'm a little bit over time, so maybe I just skip this. Um, but the uh, Chef Jake, basically he, he gave me a poem one day. And in this poem, uh, he, Basically, everything that we've been trying to train these guys over the last three years are in this poem. And I think that that's really cool to see that cultural shift. It's now, it's, it's the words that we were trying to instill in these chefs and in these cooks and in these servers um, that they're now talking to other people. And I think that that's a, a true test of culture. So if you want to implement culture, um, you know, listen to your employees. Are their words in line with what the culture and the ideology of the company is? If it is, then, then you got something rolling. But if it's not, then you probably need to work on culture a little bit more. So that's it. Any other questions? No? Cool. We have about five minutes till we go to break. Um, but any thoughts about this? And, um, what I was thinking about is what a complex business system that this is that we really admire Ken for sort of mastering and thinking about all sorts of angles of it. So I'm just curious if anybody saw any analogies to your business, whether it's a big, massive global corporation or a small Strike you as analogous? Mm -hmm. This is not, well, maybe it is analogous, but I'm just thinking about failure. Sorry, we're the Cubs, we should be thinking about winning. But <laughs> I, I think this is more a comment just how you view failure as an opportunity and how consistently that theme plays through what you're doing. But I guess the question is regrets. Do you have any? I mean, is there, is there anything or? Not, not really, honestly. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think uh, I'm always just moving forward and pushing forward. It's like, I don't drive staring at my rear view mirror. I, I drive looking at like, where am I gonna be? I'm on the offensive. Um, I don't miss, I don't miss Vegas. I don't miss um, taking this risk. It's like, our company doesn't have a giant capital stack. We still struggle. It's still hard to be profitable. Um, but I see the opportunity in that. And I think that those challenges are, what's going to make our company strong in the long run. And my company would be so much more successful if I had a restaurant in Chicago. But by us being in this demographic, I think that we're able to um, develop these systems. And it gives us time to work on these systems. And um, I think that ultimately, it's, it's going to work out for us. And it's going to be, um, hopefully, amazingly uh, beneficial. Yeah, I have a question actually. Initially, you talked about one of your um, goals being to really impact the people mm -hmm. in that area of the country and how they farm. And yes. I, I didn't hear you loop back to that and how that kind of ties in. And I was kind of curious because this, I think, impacts all of us where you, you go with one idea mm -hmm. and then maybe things shift or maybe your, your um, goal shifts or your path shifts and, and we'll come on to yeah. that. Well, I, I can remember reading uh, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. He talks about this like flywheel and this idea that you don't, you can't, you have, to, you have to have, you know, the leader of the company really needs to try to do their best to have vision and figure out where are we going with this. And it's not so much about the leader's company and them driving the bus, but surrounding yourself with the right people and getting the right people on the bus. Um, I, I set up this farm to be a showcase. And so I am influencing all these people. Um, whether they agree with our ideology or not, um, they still like good food, and they still want to come to our restaurant. 
And uh, the, the parents, so for instance, Johnny Funk uh, is a friend of mine. His family, uh, Funk Seeds, they, they have a big maple syrup farm. They've been farming for like 70, 80 years. They have 15,000 acres. His parents um, run that farm. And now he has now just become a partner. When, when he gets these fields planted with soybeans and corn, and these farmers are in the fields like four or five days out of the year, that's it, um, he comes to our farm and he's studying our techniques and we're working together. Um, for instance, combines. Uh, combines go through and they harvest the corn and the soybeans and they blow the chaff out the back. I'm like, why don't they just have a cedar on the back filled with clover seed so as they're harvesting, they're interplanting a cover crop? And it's just, it's just taking a little bit of time. I mean. The industrial system, Monsanto, the way that we've created this food system, it's like there's a huge stranglehold on that, like, that way of life. And so it's going to take a lot of examples. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is just provide a model to influence them. And I know I'm doing so. Um, we do farm tours every single week. Um, we're serving 1,000 guests a week at the restaurant. Um, and the vast majority of them are farmers. And honestly, like, deep down, I totally want the food system to fail so that we can figure this out and actually make it more sustainable. Um, but ultimately, it's like, if we have a bad harvest or if the corn crop doesn't come in nice, then my restaurant's probably not gonna be that profitable because they're not gonna be able to afford to come and dine out. And so it's interesting. So it's like, I'm just kind of like nudging it and like giving it some constant gentle pressure to put it in the direction that we need to go as a society. And it's really, it all comes, boils down to nutrients. I mean, we just need micronutrients. We need healthy people, healthy inputs. Um, and right now the farmers, they've only cared about putting three things on their field, NPK. And what we need to be putting on it is all the essential nutrients and minerals that are on the periodic table. Um, and there's, there's farmers that are catching on to this. My crop scientist um, who works with me, he works with a lot of small farmers, but he also works with all the big boys. And it's interesting, we're like coming towards each other. Next year with my bed system, I'm, I'm implementing mechanicalization. Um, we're gonna quadruple our, our amount of production. We're not gonna add one man hour to our farm. We're gonna do that through mechanizing, um, through systematic, you know, doing things not by hand, but by a tractor. Um, and so you, what's gonna happen is we, we need to kind of go together um, and we need to figure it out. I don't, I don't look at them, in the beginning I looked at them as an enemy and now I look at them as a partner. And I'm excited for the day when someone like Monsanto is calling me up saying, wow, like it's amazing what you've performed and what you've done, help us get our systems to that. And so. We have time for just maybe one more. You talked about them as like an enemy. What's the competitive landscape like when it comes to the restaurant? I, mean, I can't imagine there's another like pizza and sushi joint. Whereas like in Chicago, like, I mean, you can find anything you want any night of the week, any hour of the day. So what, what's it like there and like how does that affect how your business works? Well, Bloomington Normal is the number one. Um, it has more restaurants per capita than any other city in the United States. That they eat out all the time, but the problem is, is that it's like it's Applebee's, Burger King's, McDonald's, and they don't have upper echelon. So um, I, I have a I have a different challenge. We're in a blue ocean, but no one travels to that ocean. And whereas in Chicago, it's competitive, but we would be able to leverage that. And I don't I don't ever look back and say, well, I wish I was in Chicago because I would have uh, better access to consumers that actually understood my ideology and my food. Um, but I look at it as opportunity. If I can make this restaurant group survive in this landscape, which is so competitive and so like down here as far as knowledge and understanding of food culture, um, then I could probably launch this anywhere. And I'm honestly thinking the future of my company is not big cities like Chicago, but the, the middle-sized cities. Um, because those are the ones where I can basically move in and open up a restaurant that's designed to suit with the acreage connected to it. And so really behind all this, what I'm doing is creating the formula. I now have the formulas to be able to say, okay, I have a 180 seat restaurant. We're gonna be open lunch and dinner. We're gonna be open six days a week. We're gonna serve this type of cuisine. Well, guess what? I know exactly how many chickens you need. I know how, many, how much land you need. I know how much the cost of the inputs are gonna be. I know how many man hours you're gonna need. And then now we're gonna be able to make that. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, this system's gonna be great. It's gonna be more profitable because I'm cutting out the middleman. And honestly, it's like two to three times more expensive for me to raise anything <laughs> as opposed to the conventional byproduct. Buying a carrot from California is still so much cheaper than, but ours has 10 times the amount of nutrition, 10 times the amount of flavor. And as we mechanize things and as we make things a little bit more efficient, we're driving down our production costs. And so nothing really changed with this new restaurant. It was just that I had a dish, for instance, the chicken was always $27.50. And then I was like, well, wait a minute, we've been raising chickens for three years. Maybe our production costs has come down a little bit. <laughs> I reevaluate everything. Now the chicken's $22. 
And so that's really what I think it's about. Because right now, organic and local is kind of this like, I don't know, it's uh, this elitist thing. And what we need it to be is mainstream. We need it to be something that everyone can afford. Um, and so that's how what I'm interested in seeing, how can we drive down our cost? Um, a restaurant would, it would be suicide if a restaurant were to declare that they were 100% organic. And that's the reason why there are none. It's impossible. There's no money in that. Do you work with, I know, do you work with the university systems? Yeah, today, right now, we are um, doing the uh, 100th anniversary of the extension service in our town, and that's through the university. Uh, it's a land-grant college. It's funded by Monsanto and ADM and Cargill. And uh, it's a really big tipping point because they're even asking us and they're filming a documentary um, about us working with them and getting back to our roots. And so um, they've been an amazing resource for us, but they've never really seen it in, in the same fashion. But um, with this new farm bill, they've actually allocated a lot more dollars towards sustainable agriculture. And so now almost all the extension services have added on a full-time employee that's focused on local food. And so, like, I mean, I, th I think everyone should be a little bit more optimistic about the future of food and, and the future of sustainability because we're, there's definitely going to be a lot of things figured out in the coming years. People are really excited about it. So it's all about just, actually, it's about the next generation. So I need farmers. You know, it's like my kids, I want their friends to be farmers. We need more people. We have twice as many people in jail than we have farming right now in this country. I mean, it's like, that's not going to work. Because, like, I would love to have two inmates on my farm, right? Just give two inmates to every farmer? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I would crush it. That was terrific, Tim. Thank cool. you very much. Thank you.